Hello and welcome to Chamber Live. As uh, Simon's already said and Jen is here, we, we at the Chamber welcome you to our, our Chamber Live on recovery readiness. I have to say formally that the views expressed in this seminar do not necessarily represent the views of East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce and all the facts were believed to be correct at the time of recording on the 17th of June 2020. And obviously with the endless succession of business support packages changing every five minutes, you can understand why we need to say that. So um, it's really nice to see you all. We're, we're gradually getting to be slick at this kind of thing, aren't we? Nobody, nobody looks like they're, they're stressed out by it anymore. In fact, I think we've got a bit blasé now. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm Miranda Barker. I'm the Chief Executive of East Lancashire Chamber of Commerce. I don't think there are many who don't know us on here, but it's good to see you if, you, if you're here for the first time. And we stretch all the way from Salmsbury, just east of the M6, all the way across to the Yorkshire border. And we are one of the most commercially minded chambers in the country. Um, we have a whole load of expert products, but we're also here to work um, with all of our business communities across the whole of our, our six local authority areas. And so we, we're delighted to provide services like Chamber Life, which is here free for anyone to join. But it also gives us wonderful opportunity to support our local businesses through the pandemic. And especially to showcase those of our Diamond Ambassadors and our key members who are experts in their fields. And you're seeing three of them here today. So I'll, I'll just quickly um, tell you who our panel are, if they can wave at the appropriate moment, if we happen to have them on the front screen, that's great. But then we'll go through them in depth. We have Angela Page, Managing Director at Sagar Insurances and Padium. You can see Angela there waving if you can see her. Mark Schofield, Director and Co-owner of Howard's Chartered Accountants. Mark's still there. Mark's in his office, looking the most business-like of anyone today. And Carl Atkinson of Employment Law Specialist at, uh, Employment Law Specialist at Taylor's Solicitors. So the plan is we will go through, first of all, with our speakers individually and just give them the opportunity to say the kind of introduction they would to anyone at the moment of their clients in terms of preparing them for how do you operate your business at this moment. And then we'll have a little bit of a question and answer with that particular individual panelist. And then we'll have a, a, a go through some of the questions that have been sent in advance. And then we'll be picking through those that you're raising in chat or that you raise your hands to ask directly. So, firstly to Angela, uh, I have here that Angela has been in the insurance industry since she was 16, started out in claims, worked her way up through most departments. What she enjoys most is dealing direct with businesses, providing bespoke insurance solutions to meet clients' risk transfer requirements. And as the MD of Sagar, her vision is to grow the business organically and through acquisition. So good morning, Angela, and how are you? She needs to be unmuted so she can uh... Morning, I'm fine, thank you. Very well, good. glad to be here. Thank you very much. It's lovely to have you here. Um, so first of all, just by just by way of an introduction, what have you been saying to your clients in terms of, of how to operate at this moment? What are you what's your sort of you know headline advice to people in terms of running their business? To reassess the risk, really. Um, I think as a result of COVID-19, um, um, people have started to bust, uh, dust off their business continuity plans and assessing the risk differently to what it was pre-COVID-19. Um, lots of businesses are um, obviously experiencing, unfortunately, redu reductions in turnover. They've got staff that's furloughed. Uh, and all these are influencing factors on insurance premiums. Uh, even in terms of if you've got a fleet of uh, company vehicles and they're not on the road or you're just with the um, employees for social use, reducing the cover, excluding the business use. A lot of businesses, were, um, they, they just put them in the yard and so they've sawn them and reduced the covers to fire and theft. Um, so it really is just reassessing what the risk is that the insurance company are now insuring because it is very different to what they were insuring um, February, January time. And um, insurance companies have received instruction from the FCA that whilst it's a 12 month contract and, in, and usually you're not allowed these reductions because you've entered into a contract for 12 months, the direction from the FCA is to provide the um, policyholders where they need it with as much support as possible. And if that is by um, giving return premiums for reductions in cover, that's what we're talking to our clients about at the moment. 
So that must be very welcome for those clients then. Um, I, I think I've received some some refund for my um, car insurance actually, which is which is great. So, so are there, um, what, how should a business best analyze and disclose its, its risks at this moment? What, what's different? I think it all stems from your business continuity plan. Um, most people will, most businesses will probably have um, started to evoke, invoke their business continuity plan and develop it and, and every day it will be changing. Uh, in terms of assessing the risk, if you're an, uh, an office uh, based risk, but suddenly you've got all your staff working from home, um, you've got the, um, the, the added um, problems in terms of um, data protection, so perhaps at the moment you don't have cyber insurance and suddenly you've got 25 staff that have got a potential for being hacked into your system. So you need to look at perhaps whether cyber insurance is something that you need to be uh, considering. Uh, directors and officers liability is very important at the moment. Um, so if you're going to have a look at the actual risk um, in terms of the, uh, the, the business directors making decisions on behalf of the company, um, from a remote basis, if they're not actually in touch with each other on a regular basis, they are making decisions on behalf of other directors that, that they could actually open up quite a, uh, the floodgates in, res in respect of potential losses or claims being made against them. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's weird. We're both more in contact, but also less in contact with each other than, as, than normal, aren't we? We're missing things through not being in close proximity to each other. Absolutely, yes. Are you, are you seeing big changes in, in fluctuations in insurance rates? Are people, what's driving any changes in insurance rates at the moment? Are there some we should be really wary of? Um, we are, so pre-COVID-19, we were actually starting to see um, a hardening market. Um, we've had the benefit of what we call a soft market, which is lots of competition, uh, driving down the price of insurance. And that was starting to um, have an effect um, in terms of um, returns for insurance companies and, and for their investments, etc. So we were starting to see the rates to uh, starting to creep up. Um, it's kind of settled down a little bit whilst we go through the, the lockdown period. Um, but in terms of, I already mentioned, direct and officers liability, that we're certainly seeing um, insurance companies withdrawing from the market because they see the potential that the claims are going to start to come in on that aspect. And those that are remain, remaining are actually starting to put their rates up. And that's, that's where it usually starts. Once, once the um, insurance companies that suddenly don't want to be in that market move out of it, those that remain gives them the opportunity to be able to put their rates up. So I think over the next six to 12 months, we'll, we'll definitely be seeing the, the premium rates going up because of the claims that um, uh, are being made at the moment. Um, just to talk a little bit about what's happening in the insurance industry that's quite significant. Um, the, there is a, a test case being brought by the FCA, uh, planned to be heard in July, and that's taking um, between eight and 10 major insurers, um, uh, challenging them in terms of whilst their policies were not actually written to include cover for pandemic. The underwriters hadn't really done their job as thorough as they should, therefore their, their wordings were what we would call a little bit woolly. Mm -hmm. And so the FCA is challenging those wordings to see if some claims can be made uh, and paid out. Now that has um, quite an effect on the insurance industry because first of all, the insurance company didn't intend to insure pandemics. So they haven't included that in the costings. And because of that, if they do end, end up having to make, pay the claims out, we'll see those insurance companies possibly disappear because they've just not got the reserves to pay those claims. And secondly, the, the market going forward will just be, it will be closed down. You will not be able to get insurance from a, a straightforward insurance company for pandemic. Um, Sagars are owned by GRP Group and GRP has Lord Hunt, who's a former uh, member of parliament, on a, uh, on a panel and they are currently discussing setting up something similar to, I don't know if people have heard about Pool Re, which was a, um, a government backed uh, insurance uh, based product for terrorism. So um, in the early 90s when 
terrorism attacks occurred in London. A lot of the insurance companies were reluctant to continue with terrorism cover. So the government set up uh, Pool Re to cover so you could buy terrorism back. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what they're looking possibly, it's only in its very early stages, to set up something similar on a pandemic re. Uh, yeah. And that will be interesting because it's it, what happened with Pool Re was that people that bought the bought into that insurance were those that were suscept more susceptible to being um, victims of a terrorist attack. So your big cities, especially London, and the same thing is going to be with the pandemic re. It's going to be the hospitality, leisure industry, and all those. They're the only ones going to be buying it because office workers can just quite happily just send all their staff to work from home to manage that risk. So it, it, it is very interesting times that we're going to be coming in, challenging as well. That's that's what I thought you were going to say. Actually, was that it would it would be really appealing to the hospitality sector. You could definitely see how that would be an essential from now going forward. But um, yes, those insurance companies whose wording hasn't been tight enough to be able to exclude it. If they they've suddenly got claims from all of their customers, you know, they're going to be dead in the water, aren't they? Absolutely, because as I said, they they're just not rated for it. Um, and um, you know, we're, we're recommending to all our clients. Uh, even though we possibly know that the, the, the cover is not there, that a claim is submitted um, because on the back of the, the test case that's going through, um, there may be other uh, things that come into legislation that enable insurance companies to, with the support of the government uh, to meet those claims. But the, the, the worrying thing is that it's going to be a long, long time down the road because I, even if the, the claim by F, the FCA is successful, we have no doubt that the insurance companies will appeal. So we're going to be in for a long, long process and how many businesses can sustain um, not having an insurance policy payout um, and, and they're not being able to trade. So those businesses are going to disappear. And that, that's the worrying part from, from our point of view is the time that this is going to take. Absolutely, but that's, but that's your advice basically, is if anyone thinks they've got a question of malaria in their insurance at all, put a claim in so it can then sit and at least be there to, uh, if, if the, 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 case, the test case goes the right way. In. But like you say, it's, it's an unsurvivable length of time, but at least they would get something, wouldn't they? If, yeah, depending on how loose the policy wordings are. A lot of the policy wordings that, that are what we call watertight, it, it specifically does, is either a specified disease or a notifiable disease, and it's completely excluded. Um, so those are the ones. But if there's just that area of um, uh, doubt, then definitely you, you should be submitting a claim to your insurance broker or your insurance company. That's an action from every, for everyone from today is, is go forth and look and tell your, tell your colleagues to look for sure. Um, Absolutely. What, what common areas do you see businesses underinsured in? I mean, apart from obviously the exclusion of pandemic from the wording that we would like to have. Um, I think the biggest question that we've, the, 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 the problem that we face as insurance brokers is the, um, the reinstatement values of either machinery or buildings, etc. cetera. Um, what tends to happen is that businesses do forget um, the way that over the last five or 10 years, the, the, the cost of labor has increased. So the cost of rebuilding a property as opposed to its market value can be far, there's a, there's a big void between those two. So we always recommend that three to five years, you get a professional valuation. And the same with your uh, machinery and other assets. Um, you know, if you just just by the way that the pound has fallen against the dollar and the euro automatically, if you're getting your machinery from abroad then that value of that machinery is going to cost a lot more to replace nowadays than it did when you bought it perhaps eight or 10 years ago. And most policies are written on a reinstatement new for old basis. And that's the most important area um, because what happens then is that um, the insurance company would invoke uh, average clause and um, putting that in very um, layman's terms basically if you've got a, an item of machinery and it, it, it you've, you're insuring it for fifty thousand pounds turns out it to replace it, it's going to cost a hundred thousand pounds you're basically self-insuring for fifty percent so fifty percent of your claim is down to you and the fifty percent will be met by the insurance company so that's something i hate to mention it that's something that the whole the whole um brexit factor is going to be in there isn't it if we're dealing with with equipment would have to obtain from overseas and of, of course the, the rules regulations and taxations may be changing so 
Exactly. So it's so important to just not not look at your asset register, but to actually look at the valuation for a, a replacement on a new for all basis. Or you can actually ask your insurance company to to switch your policy onto an indemnity policy, which is paying you for the value of the machinery at the time of the loss. But then the problems are if you, if it's only partially destroyed, it's the replacement parts. If you need new parts, you'd only be getting the indemnity price from the insurance company. So that's that's the second lesson from today, isn't it? To evaluate what you're insuring and decide which is the best basis to, to have it on. So you're doing that consciously, not not just falling into an automatic trap of what you've got, not suiting what your needs needs might be. That's right. Yes, that's brilliant. Well, thank you very much for for now, Angela. We'll uh, we'll carry on and introduce our second panelist. So Mark Mark Schofield. Um, Mark was born in Oldham, brought up in Morecambe, and has lived and worked in Accrington since 1985 owner and director of course of Howard's Chartered Accountants, alongside his fellow owner and director, Paul Spencer, and Howard's provide accountancy type services typically to larger SMEs in East Lancs. So good morning, Mark, nice to see you. And what's your sort of standard advice you're giving to your clients at the moment? What's your sort of startup attempt, make sure you do these things or else? Well, there um, isn't a standard advice because what we're seeing <clears throat> is the widest reaction you can imagine to this whole crisis. We're seeing um, some businesses prospering um, because their product that they're producing is now in demand. We're seeing some businesses whose results can only be described as bizarre because they've got staff on furlough, they have rent holidays, they've got loan repayment holidays. And actually they're making a profit where you would never expect them to make a profit. We've got businesses which are apparently unaffected by the crisis um, and we pretty much fall into that category. All our staff might be all working remotely um, but the fact of the matter is that everybody's doing the same job that they were doing pre the 23rd, 24th of March. Um, we've got businesses which are completely cocooned um, and you're just waiting for it to re-emerge and we've got businesses which are in dire straits uh, which is typically the ones that we've got um, tourism and hospitality is in dire straits um, interestingly the one which I thought we were going to have a really big problem with which was retail um, we're not seeing that really big problem it's certainly tough but it's not um, really really hard so in terms of general advice, well, there is no general advice because there is such a widespread of situations. Um, however, what we are, uh, the way our minds work is, first of all, have conversations about with people about how they see their sales going and how they see their sales going as we emerge from lockdown. And that takes you straight away to working capital because what we're seeing for quite a number of companies, businesses, is that their working capital, their cash flow has dried up. And there's an element of new startup, except some of these businesses are quite big to be having a new startup. So how are we going to finance that? And we're also seeing what I have a feeling is the start of um, redundancies. So we have, well, only this morning, I discovered that as a first of our clients, who is a major employer, is looking at redundancies. So up until this morning, that's not a conversation we've been involved in. Um, however, it would appear, I have a suspicion, it's a conversation we're going to be involved in quite a bit as time goes forward. We've seen a fairly moderate uptake of the Seabills loan, um, which surprised me i thought that when it first came in it was it wasn't it was hardly any take up people were just completely confused about it including the banks uh, however the one we are seeing people taking up now is the bounce back loan um so it's almost a case of well why wouldn't you you've got a, a loan which is, doesn't have to be repaid for a year it's on a moderate interest rate no interest at all for two for, for 12 months no personal security and yesterday i had a case where the particular client they have a business mortgage 
and they spoke to their bank and said, um, we, we think we're going to emerge from lockdown. And we, we've done all right, they use the phrase, kept our head above water so far, but we are worried as we start to emerge whether we've got enough cash around us. And they said, um, how do you feel about us being eligible for the bounce back loan? The bank manager said, yes, you are. And then they asked another question, which is if we don't need the bounce back loan to run our business, could we use it to pay off a lump of our business mortgage? To which the bank manager said, yes, they could. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think that was a really interesting comment, certainly one which I've filed away in my head and which I'll be repeating many times. Yeah, I've um, seen that well. With, uh, with some of their parents where they were uh, where they were where they were going to have to take some sort of finance in the near term to purchase equipment, and they've found that, well actually you know their their cash flow was reasonably secure, but the best way they could finance the purchase of that equipment was effectively to use the bounce back loan. Bounce back loan, yeah. So I think that's a fairly comprehensive answer to your question. <laughs> I think, it's, I think it's an excellent answer. My dog is snoring off camera, which is why I keep muting myself, and I'm muting myself. Um, and I, I'm short of putting my hand over his nose. There's not an easy way to make him be quiet, actually. Um, so I think, I think we're, we're worrying about the same thing that you are, that, that businesses have, have got through in whatever way they could the, the lockdown process, and we know which ones have really suffered through that. But now we're entering a second sort of... Um, unknown stage where we, we wait to see where the, those redundancies are, are, are happening. You know, we've all heard of various companies over the last few days who tragically have, have either had to make redundancies or, or, or gone into liquidation completely. Um, so I, that's the worry, isn't it, that we now see this creeping process as people come back to work and can't sustain themselves in a, in a, a post furlough capacity. Well, it's absolutely right. As I say, our own client bank, we haven't seen that yet, but that's not to say we're not going to. So uh, we'll just have to see how that one pans out, I'm afraid. I do have a, a particular concern about East Lancashire, which is that our economy here is um, heavily based on aerospace and engineering. We've all seen what's happened to aerospace with all the, the aircraft lined up waiting for some passengers. And when lockdown took place, when it, I just had, thought, well, I'll have a look on the Airbus website. And I tapped in the words backlog order book. And the answer was just over 7,000 aircraft. So this was at lockdown. And that was what's substantial what well, we, we, we've got the supply chain haven't we here in East Lancashire so there's there's the driver for our aerospace ex, uh, experience here in, in East Lancashire and, and it's a worry to me that if that backlog order book starts to, to fall dramatically then what's going to happen to our supply chain here in East Lancashire and that supply chain is sustaining so many other jobs and so many other businesses. And I think that's an area to be seriously concerned about going forward. Yeah, yeah, no, I couldn't agree with you more. Um, it, it was a sector that was already under pressure, both from, from Airbus um, with the, the, the pulling back on the A380 orders and also the Boeing 737 MAX issues before we started. And we worry that it has a really big effect locally. Um, do, you think, do you think COVID is going to change how our, our, our businesses do business? Oh, absolutely, yes. <laughs> so we've got a very good example of it right here. So we've all discovered Zoom, and uh, we may have our, you know, we've got our reservations about Zoom, but the fact of the matter is it works. So why would you travel two hours for a two-hour meeting when you can have a Zoom meeting? I think that's going to impact on, on especially on international and air travel. It's bound to, isn't it? Yeah. So there's a, and, and then another area which we are seeing uh, is that our staff, our team here at Howarth's, uh, we've had two client surveys, and what's coming from those client surveys is that there's a small number of people, which, which I'm one, who really don't like working from home and want to get back into the office as fast as we can. We've got an even smaller number of people who prefer working from home, and then the great body of people want to work partly from home and partly from the office. 
Um, and that's going to take us straight to, do we need this big office here in Accrington? Mm. What's that going to do for property rentals and property prices? It's a, 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 that, for us office type people, I think that's um, a potential revolutionary change. I think you're absolutely right. I think it's, it's forced us to all experience something we weren't quite sure what we thought about before. And we've had to live with it and found it, it, it it's not necessarily a terrible thing, although I'm not sure, I'm not sure we'd want to keep on doing it 24-7 like we have been. No. The, halfway, the halfway in between might be something flexible working, might be the, the new de rigueur way of operating in a really true sense of flexible working. And what you know, the, the digital technologies now, I think, well, you've alluded to it already. If you went back, what, 10 years, you'd have no chance. It would be really, really hard but the fact of the matter is that here we are in 2020 and we are able to work a uh, professional services business 100% distributed. And that's, I think that's amazing. <laughs> Huge change. Huge change. Thank you for now, Mark. That's, that's wonderful. And just to introduce our third speaker for today, Carl Atkinson, who's the Employment Law Specialist at Taylor's Solicitors. Carl's a, a consultant solicitor at Taylor's in Blackburn specialises in employment law and data privacy work, over 25 years experience of acting for senior executives and businesses throughout Lancashire around the UK, and Carl provides pragmatic and commercial advice and is frequently quoted in leading human resources publications. And if there ever is a minefield at this moment, it's around the, the human resources and including the whole flexible working piece I'm sure we'll, we'll get back to. So good morning, Carl. And what a, mm. how are you... Um, you know, starting the conversation with your businesses now in, in terms of what they should be prepared for and how they should operate? Well, I think there's been, um, what I've seen is an ongoing conversation around the same theme, probably for the past few months, uh, relating to furlough, uh, furlough leave and the application of the um, government scheme to different businesses. And it's quite, it's been quite interesting um, from an employment law perspective, that furlough is completely alien concept to UK law, it simply didn't exist uh, in the UK before March, was no indication from anywhere that it was going to be rolled out, came completely out of the left field. And so the, really, it, it's been intriguing that in sort of February and March, what I was seeing were conversations beginning to happen with businesses about focus on staff costs, possibility of reduced headcount, possibility of redundancy. Then suddenly a bolt out of the blue appears, furlough comes from nowhere. Everybody then, or certainly people began to step back from those conversations about redundancy. The furlough scheme originally was in designed um, to protect jobs. It was very overt, uh, did what it said on the tin. Um, and I think there is a, a feeling that it's, it's put a bit of a sticking plaster over a wound and everybody's kind of got a bit of time or had a bit of time where they've not had to face into the risk of redundancies except for perhaps some businesses where it was clear that that was going to be inevitable. I'm thinking about BA and people like that. Um, so the conversation that I've been having with clients for a few weeks now, I, I suppose initially there was lots of questions about the furlough scheme because the government kept tinkering with it and kept changing it. So there were lots of questions about, does it cover this? Does it cover that? All that kind of stuff. Then for a few weeks, I've been talking to businesses about using the time that they've got now to try and think about how things are going to be for them and their business whenever they face into coming back to the new normal, if you want to use that phrase, or Independence Day or whatever label you want to put on it. But whenever this kind of lockdown period ends, um, there is going to be probably a different environment for businesses and I think some are going to be better prepared to meet the challenges of that new environment than others um, and obviously the businesses that are better prepared are probably going to do better than those that aren't. 
So this is this is very much stage two, isn't it now, especially from your point of view. So that, that furlough scheme is changing and we're now heading into this flexible period. How are you advising companies to take advantage of that to, to ease themselves back into working efficiently and effectively? Well, I suppose there are quite a lot of questions in all of this. And, and one question that I think is really important, but I think sometimes gets a bit lost is, what kind of business do you want at the end of all of this? Do you want to work in the same way that you worked before? Do you just want to go back to the old normal or do you actually want to be something different? And if the answer to that is that you take a view that the world is going to change and there is going to be an impact on your business and you can work in a different way and maybe, as Mark said, you might want to review ways of working and your working environment, then actually you need to be thinking about transitioning towards that objective. If what you want to do is just go back to the old normal, then you're going in a different direction potentially. Uh, the flexible furlough idea is really interesting and one that I had been hoping the government would um, implement. I think it's been used in Germany for a while and I think what it may do is allow businesses to ease workers back into the workplace um, and you know we can talk about the extent to which there may be challenges for some businesses about getting employees back um, but it will be able, it will allow businesses to ease them back on a part time basis. And it will allow, I think, the option for some businesses to look at the potential for having perhaps an A team and a B team system of work working. So I think John Lewis have already said that they're going to move to uh, rotors for their colleagues um, in their business, which would mean that. I think some of the thinking behind this is that if there is a, uh, a second spike in the virus or, or it you know, comes back with increased vigour or, or, or whatever in the autumn, um, then if you've got two teams of workers, it should mitigate the risk that you have an outbreak of infection amongst the workforce and then yeah. find that vast numbers of people are isolating or infected. So, you know, that's, I think, a question of thinking about the way that the scheme could be used and yeah. thinking about how you can optimise that for your particular business. No, I think, I think again, it, it goes back to something that Angela said. It's about, it's about being really conscious about what you're doing and why, isn't it? You, like you say, being, being conscious of... of what kind of model do I want to go back to? Am I intending to just try and snap my fingers and go back to where I was? Or is this heading in a new direction? And can I see where it's going? Can I plan for it? And can I utilize all of the flexible working to, to protect my workforce going forward? Do we, do we have um, new responsibilities as, in, as employers with our, our workforce? Is it, is there, are there more things we have to be careful of to protect them when they're coming back to work? Well, the, employee, the responsibilities are effectively the same. All businesses have, uh, employers have an obligation to provide employees with a safe system of work, safe workplace, safe workmates, all that kind of stuff. It, it's the old health and safety legislation that's been around in the UK for a long time that we're all fairly well familiar with. But obviously it's now um, applying to a new type of risk that perhaps businesses are not considered um, to be significant prior to now. What should businesses be doing if they, if they believe their future turnover won't support their existing overheads? What, what sort of planning need they to be doing now in terms of preparing for managing that, that risk if that's what they fear when they come back? Well, just a, a couple of minutes ago, I mentioned that in sort of early March, uh, I was actually quite surprised how quickly businesses were talking to me about redundancies mm -hmm. and reducing headcounts. Um, I had thought 
that businesses might be carrying some capacity to have a period of time before getting to that point. But in fact, I found that people were moving to those kind of conversations very quickly. And I think there's an argument that what the furlough scheme has done is effectively bought time, but possibly not addressed the underlying issue of what the trading environment um, is going to be like whenever we get to Independence Day or New Normal or whatever it is. Um, and I think that if businesses, if people form the view that it's going to be a very challenging trading environment and they are not going to need the same level of staff or they can't justify the same employee cost in the future that they had in the past, then inevitably that's going to mean that they're looking at, they'll have to look at ways of reducing employee cost. And, you know, I'm back to the conversations then that I was having in, in March, and that is a, would be around um, varying contract terms and conditions with employees to take out cost. And that can be done fairly quickly by consent. And, you know, we've seen examples of, well, high profile examples of that at the moment are the professional rugby union players in the Premiership who are under pressure to have their wages cut by about 25%. Um, and there, are, there is a possibility that businesses will be able to negotiate that with staff. If not, there would be the potential to enforce a variation to contract terms and conditions by dismissing staff and offering to re-engage them on different contract terms, that brings a whole host of legal challenges with it and it's never an easy exercise. And then the other alternative is redundancies. And if businesses form the view that redundancies are an inevitability for them, and I am talking to clients now who are, you know, that's their view, then if they're making or looking at potentially more than 20 um, employees being made redundant, they'll have collected consultation obligations, which will lock them in to minimum consultation periods. So be 30 days for 20 or more and 100 or more, it's going to be 45 days. So that imposes, begins to impose a bit of an interesting calculation on the whole business about furlough the furlough scheme is due to end at the end of october um and that there is a sort of declining level of contribution from the government from i think august onwards it begins to run down albeit marginally um but for businesses that want to um maximize the period of furlough that's available to them they're probably going to be looking at consultation exercises beginning during the furlough leave. And that me might mean that there is um, a kind of deadline date that would probably be somewhere in mid-September when anybody considering a large scale redundancy exercise would need to kick it off. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, yeah. we might do that. Yeah, you, you calculate back 45 days from end of yep. October and that gets you to whenever, it, you know, you can do the maths, it's probably mid-September sometime. Um, but we may see that and part of the reason, there was a lot of talk about why the government extended the furlough scheme last time round when they did. And I think a, a lot of employment lawyers were saying that there was quite a lot of pressure coming on from large employers who were saying, that there was going to be one date where they would all start collective consultation together. And, you know, you can have your own view on, on, on how much government policy at the moment is being driven by PR. But I, I sus suspect that the government didn't fancy the PR, um, the negative PR that would develop from suddenly loads of businesses engaging in collective consultation, affecting thousands, thousands and thousands of people. So we, we're likely to see that. Uh, and, and, you know, there is a view that it's inevitable that if you have lots of redundancies, you'll then have lots of employment litigation afterwards. So that's the way it's probably going to go. There's going to be a very turbulent time. Um, I actually think for the professions around the table, we've got in our speakers today. 
So thank you, thank you very much for you all um, for your, those individual um, um, discussions. If we can move to just looking at some of the questions I've got posed in advance, but really as a discussion between the speakers. Um, so if we can unmute our, our speakers and then just see how it works in terms of us coming in and, and, and feeding into the same questions. I wanted, especially with the news of the Seafood Pub Company, to pick up a, a question we've had from Via De Niro from the University of Central Lancashire, where she's asked, how do we envisage hospitality, leisure and tourism recovering as being one of those, those sectors most significantly affected? And it's probably highest in the media locally as well as, as aerospace. What, it, what as uh, speakers, have you got advice that you're able to give or um, things that you foresee happening as, as that sector particularly starts to come back into operation? Do you want me to pick, start that? That's fine, Mark, no problem. The, um, we do have clients in hospitality and leisure. We have a, a, a smaller satellite office up in the lovely little town of Settle, uh, and we've got quite a few tourism and hospitality cases out of there, including caravan parks, there's some quite big businesses uh, in that sector. But what we're seeing in uh, hospitality is it's uh, really, really bad. This two, uh, two metre social distancing rule, what it actually means is that for a lot of these businesses, it is simply not possible for them to make a profit. They can't do it. Um, so if we stick with the two metre social distancing rule, the fact of the matter is that those businesses are unlikely to reopen because they'll just make a loss. If the, if the social distancing rule comes down to a metre, then that becomes a different, different kettle of fish. But even there, uh, there's, there's, there's restaurants I know where they, they're nice and cosy. The reason why people went there was because it was a very cosy, close atmosphere which people joined in with and, and it was just not going to happen. So I am worried about that sector. Caravan parks, um, which is quite a big sector, the, there what you see is something quite different. So there's an argument that some of them should be able to trade right now because if you've got a static caravan, then you're completely socially isolated anyway. You are self-contained and it's the same if you've got a touring caravan although you may have to make use some use of the toilet facilities in that sector it's the campsites where there's a problem where people do have to make use of communal facilities mm -hmm. but by and large i think that's an area which is going to have a, a, a big problem and i do worry and wonder what we will end up with there all these little cafes that we like going to for our coffee and cake where will they be no, that's 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 precisely precisely what we're hearing. I mean, the statistics are, are scary. The uh, the general ones are that a a, a a small sort of food outlet doesn't doesn't become profitable until it's sixty percent occupied plus, and with social distancing at, at, at two meters, it can't get more than thirty percent occupied as, as a baseline. So that's the whole discussion around the one meter, and it's it's not necessarily our job to say should it be one or should it be two. But what we don't want to see is endless discussion for months and months and then it goes to one because then you've lost any advantage that that might have given them in the ability to open back up if it's going to change change it now or, or or don't change it but don't don't discuss for months and months then open up and having and change it and have missed that opportunity but and angela and carl what what impact are you anticipating seeing on on the sector angela you were first to unmute so i'm going to go with you <laughs> well just on that, I mean, um, Seafood Pub was actually one of our clients, so we, we obviously we were uh, first in, in line to, to find out what was going on there. And it, it's as with any in that sector, it, it's really it's really sad news. I think for me, whether it's two meters or one meter, I think it's also really a question of of how that business, if it can reopen, is how they portray themselves to the general public. I think the general public now is so wary of being in close proximity to another person that even uh, at one meter, they may not want to attend. Um, and, and it's getting those numbers and the confidence in the business. And I think that business needs to um, be able to uh, satisfy those people that have got that anxiety about mixing with people outside their bubbles or family. Uh, and it's what they can, they can demonstrate to, to the visitors that 
what they're doing in terms of um, hygiene. So the, you know, the hand sanitizer, the toilet facilities, how often are they cleaned? I mean, we, it, it, it's an extra, possibly a, a two more employees that they're going to have to employ yeah. at a time when they, they can't afford those staff overheads to make sure that those facilities are um, sanitized at such a, on such a regular basis that people feel confident to be able to go and, and, and be close or use shared facilities. And that, that's, that's a big worry. And I, I haven't got a, you know, a silver bullet that, that can put that right, unfortunately. Yeah, you're exactly right. It's how confident is the public to come back and, and do that? Um, and it, it is tragic hearing about the seafood pub company. I, I, every single person I've spoken to, we were also close to all of those venues. Carl, what were you going to add? Um, I was I was just going to add a couple of thoughts. Really, um, one of the things that I have been seeing with quite a uh, well uh, a university that uh, I, I act for at the moment is that they're undertaking modelling exercise based upon the premise of two meters and a different exercise based on one meter and um, it's quite clear from what I hear about that that it's basically not viable for them you know they won't be um, any kind of you might describe as normal student experience um, from September onwards with um, two meter distancing required they just can't do it can't certainly can't have lectures certainly can't have seminars you know, query if students are not going to be taught in person, are they going to show up at all? Um, and the implications of that are so huge uh, in uh, economically. Uh, I think it's fairly inevitable which way this is going to go. I think it's just a question of time um, before the government announced they're going to have to reduce it to one metre. Um, and then... I think the other issue here, without getting too political, is that there doesn't seem to be any um, definitive roadmap. Um, we're not seeing that kind of guidance from the government. So I think it would have been more helpful. Uh, and I'm thinking in part about the situation in Ireland, where there was a clearer roadmap for a return or movement towards the new normal. If the government were able to say it's going to be two meters for a period of time, then it'll drop down to one meter, then it'll be whatever, you know, whatever it'll be. Yeah. And then government uh, businesses in the hospitality sector would know that they might be opening on a date, if it is going to be 4th of July, they'd be opening on the 4th of July, and there might be a period where they are making a loss, but the loss would reduce at a time after that. Um, and then they would have the ability to plan to move back into into profit. Um, I am interested to hear what people say about concerns, consumer concerns about um, use of hospitality businesses. I actually suspect there might be issues around kind of the other end of the spectrum. I think there might be um, an over enthusiastic uh, return to the use of the hospitality sector um, I live in the suburb of Manchester and some, you know, we've already had issues in Ancoats in Manchester with some businesses opening, supplying takeaway um, booze and food and, and they've had to close down because, yeah. Yeah. you know, it, it just became apocalypse, apocalypse now in the city centre. So we've seen, we've seen the pictures, haven't we, on the news? I think, I think that point about um, government giving a roadmap in terms of timetable of when that enables people to make the decision about when they reopen. I think that's an excellent, excellent suggestion to put. I'll, I'll feed that back through the British Chambers of Commerce sight lines, actually, so they can drop that into the conversation with government. If you'd like to start putting some questions on, on, on the chat, we've probably got time for a couple. Meanwhile, I'll ask one more from, from my list. Um, great comment from, from Neil about the fact that the food prep area in, in even big restaurants is often tiny and that's going to be really hard for people to social distance in. And just one question while you're putting them onto, onto chat. Um, Nick Paul from the AMRC in the Northwest has asked, do we feel that there are going to be potential claims in relation to COVID in the workplace? And what action should businesses be taking to head those off and manage those if they happen? If any of our speakers would like to come in on those. 
Uh, yeah, perhaps I could help with that. Um, interestingly, what I've already seen is one particular union advising their union members to contact employers at the point where employers were asking people to come back into work and saying, in effect, um, we want to see your risk assessment that you've undertaken relating to particularly COVID. And I would recommend, I've been recommending to businesses for a while, that they're undertaking a specific risk assessment uh, before they bring employees back. But asking uh, businesses to provide that risk assessment and also, interestingly, asking them to confirm that they will accept a liability for any um, injuries that, or, or you know, however you want to define injuries, um, develop out of a return to work and some kind of tacit suggestion that that would extend beyond the employee to the employee's immediate family. And of course, you know, the advice I gave to employers was just to squash that very firmly at that point and not engage with it. But I'm sure, um, you know, from an insurance perspective, um, that must be quite a concern. So yes, I think that people will um, certainly raise that issue. Uh, I'd be interested to know from an insurance perspective about where businesses will sit with that. Mm -hmm. Angela, um, where businesses will, 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 will businesses sit with that? And also Mark asks, what sort of insurance will we need to cover home working? That's two for you. Okay. <laughs> um, but de dealing with, uh, with Carl's um, question, really, um, under the Employers Liability Act, um, the insurer is automatic, uh, sorry, the employer is automatically responsible and it's for the employer to prove that they're not responsible However, I think the wordings will uh, again be um, changed um, as, the, as time evolves. But I think the main thing is that um, there will be, it, it, uh, Carl perhaps correct me if I'm wrong, but it'd be, it would be on strict liability in terms of how, how would you actually prove that the, the, the COVID had actually been um, um, had manifested on the premises and this is a lot around a lot of the business interruption claims that are being made at the, at the moment I've got the cover why am I not being paid and it's because the policy wording actually says that the the disease has to be man, has to manifest on the premises and I think that's where the insurance companies are going to have a big fight on their hands and they will do everything they can to defend those claims to the point because how do you prove that it, it was actually manifested at the work premises and not somebody that's caught it in uh, a local takeaway collecting a, a takeaway and then brought it into the premises and it just happens to um, um, somebody's con contracted it from 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 the workplace I think that's you know th there's going to be a, a very strong um, defense by the insurance companies because otherwise that really does open up the floodgates yeah, yeah. How do you how do you show that that's what happened and demonstrated and so that's what about exactly our workers at home? How how do we how do we protect ourselves from claims from accidents from people working at home? So at the moment, um, most insurance policies have, have automatically said that they it's covered that they, they, they'll provide the cover. They they recognise that these. Um, particular circumstances are extraordinary and they're uh, amending the policy very um, op open worded so that if you if you had actually got all your staff to work from home I would still recommend that everybody does check that they are covered for that but um, you are still required under your um, health and safety at work to do the appropriate risk assessment so you should be getting all your staff to do a work from home risk assessment one thing I didn't mention earlier uh, um, about things to consider um, insurance wise is that um, insurance policies, office policies, factory policies, all any commercial type policies will have an unoccupancy warranty on them. So if your premises have been unoccupied for a certain period of time, whilst again, insurance companies are being as flexible as they can and they've extended the, it's usually about 30 days on occupancy, they've extended it to 60, some of it have just done it indefinitely. But again, you really do need to check with your insurers just what the terms are in terms of uh, unoccupancy. Um, it, there may be some requirements in terms of you visiting it weekly, you um, sealing up post boxes, turning off the services, all that sort of thing. So, yeah, it's uh, all of these things to make sure we don't invalidate our insurances, isn't it? We're right. uh, 
we're coming up to half past, so it's nearly time to, to close. So just in, in terms of wrapping up, it sounds like the general advice is, is, first of all, make sure we're doing things really deliberately. Let's look at our insurance policies and make sure that they're, they're giving us the ability to claim for that equipment in the right way that's going to be beneficial for us. Look forward at our, our business models and make a conscious decision about whether we're trying to come back to where we were before or we're deciding on a new normal and where is that going to be? Don't let the events just take us. Let's make a decision. Let's look at the potential financing opportunities and how we can use them in a way to best serve the business. And make sure we're protected for those, those workers working at home and that we, we're not going to end up with when any um, claims coming back on us. But most of all, keep talking to each other and keep getting that information shared and ask the questions because these are questions we've never had to ask before. So we've got a wealth of experience around, around the room, around the chamber. Keep those questions coming in so we can field you to people that you, you might be able to get support from. So lastly, huge thanks to, to Angela and to Carl and to Mark. And thank you for being in the hot seat. Thank you to Simon and Jen for managing behind the scenes. Well, thank you very much, everybody. Um, if, you, uh, if you want to come back uh, to us soon, we've got a whole host of events on the, on the menu you can sign into. And even more importantly, tell us what you want to hear. Tell us what events you would like to put us on, uh, put on for you. Raise your hand if you want to be a speaker. We'd love to hear from you. And thank you very much for being here.